Good morning to all our participants in the UK and good afternoon to all our participants in this part of the world. Thank you for joining today's BMCC Trade Webinar Series. We are proud to welcome attendees from six different countries and additionally, we are glad to see that there is quite a lot of interest in this event as we are 100% fully subscribed. We would like to thank all our partners, fellow chambers in the UK in supporting us to promote this webinar. Today's topic will be the future of international trade in uncertain times with a focus on Malaysia and the ASEAN region. My name is Samantha and I am Trade and Engagement Manager at the BMCC. Today, we are pleased to collaborate with HSBC Bank, a sterling member of the BMCC, as well as the UK ASEAN Business Council, UK ABC, our key partner in the UK. In today's session, our experts will be focusing on the outflow of international trade in the ASEAN region, opportunities for UK businesses in Malaysia, Asia trade updates, as well as practical insights and sustainable approach to mitigate the impact and continuity beyond this critical period. So, joining us today from BMCC, our very own Executive Director, Jennifer Lopez, who will be giving a brief introduction to our chamber and quick overview. From the UKBC, we have Paul North, Director Trade, who will be sharing about the opportunities for UK business in ASEAN. It's Minds of Business Leaders. And Visha Karanwal, Country Head and Visha Karanwal, Country Head of International Subsidiary Banking at HSBC Bank Malaysia, who will be talking about why Malaysia is the gateway to ASEAN, the strengths and successes. So before I pass the session over to our speakers, just a note, if you have any questions to ask during the session, please submit your questions via the function available and not the chat function. The speakers will then choose the questions to answer during the Q&A session after the presentations. Without further ado, I would like to pass this session over to Jennifer Lopez. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all the participants in the UK and uh, good, good evening to everyone in Malaysia and around the region. Can I uh, ask our admin to put on the slide, please? What I'll do now is just to give a very quick overview about the chamber because we have quite a number of participants from the UK. So uh, in regards to the chamber, very quickly, the chamber has been established since 1963 and our main focus is advancing bilateral trade relations between the United Kingdom and Malaysia. And very importantly, we have been providing the support to UK businesses in Malaysia via networking and B2B engagement, branding and exposure, business to government engagement, and importantly, supporting UK businesses in Malaysia's market entry into Malaysia. So we are very well rooted in the region and also in Malaysia due to UK-Malaysia's long-standing relationship. Next slide, please. I would just like to take uh, you know, to emphasize on the trade and market entry services that we offer to UK businesses in Malaysia and also to our members here. Um, the BMCC is currently the official delivery partner of the Department for International Trade in UK. So we support UK businesses with business matching, tailored market research report, event management services. We have conducted a number of successful product launches, bespoke networking programs and trade missions. Due to the current conditions, we are of course thinking about virtual trade missions and we'll be pleased to speak to you know, anyone who's interested in this area. Next slide, please. We'd also like to share with you a few of the collaterals that we have to promote the you know, opportunities for UK businesses. For example, we have this publication called Opportunities for UK Business in Malaysia which is out now, a series of webinars. For, uh, this is our, one of our first ones that we are organizing and also a catalog of expertise available from within our diverse membership to support UK companies set up in Malaysia. Next, please. Just 
to share with you, I think many of you will be already aware we are part of the British Chamber of Commerce, providing opportunity to extensive network of ch chambers and companies around the world. And also we are proud to be part of the Britain in Southeast Asia Network, a group of nine business chambers and business councils across the Southeast Asia region. Next. Next, please. So um, before I pass on to the ex subject matter experts to speak about the impact to, of COVID-19 to Malaysia, just a quick overview of Malaysia. Malaysia is part, part of Southeast Asia and become, it is a, a good example or a gold standard of a developing country in the region. Currently, we are at the 32 million population. English is widely spoken and this is a business language. We have a skilled talent pool and continuous government efforts to upgrade talent. We have a strong education system which is based by the UK, very strongly based on UK education. Strong focus, very importantly, especially in current conditions, on digital infrastructure and transformation. We, are, we have shifted to more service, knowledge and innovative-based economy and is definitely your gateway to ASEAN. Next, please. Why Malaysia? Very quickly, vibrant business environment, affinity towards British-made goods and services, a well-developed financial system, a market-oriented economy. I will, you know, I must say we have very good supportive government policies, pro-business policies, responsive government support in terms of the agencies that we work with, an attractive and tax and other incentives. As I mentioned earlier, an educated workforce, multilingual, and of course, you know, those of you who have been to Malaysia and aware about Malaysia, you will know that we have a very well-developed infrastructure in place. Just to quickly share with you on um, the opportunities for UK businesses, technology or digital is of course at the top now, especially in current conditions. The speakers from HSBC will share which are the sectors that are impacted and which are the sectors are actually in high demand currently. So tech, renewables, oil and gas, advanced mm -hmm. manufacturing, I will not go in detail, Healthcare, we have been doing very well in our healthcare in Malaysia, especially in current situation. Education has always been a priority for, Malay for UK businesses in Malaysia because of the long-standing relationship between UK and Malaysia. Uh, food and drinks and retail continue to be important. Of course, currently the focus is always will be on e-commerce. Any opportunities, expertise on e-commerce will be in demand. And last but not least, the infrastructure. There are certain delays currently due to the current situation, but we look at long-term opportunities. Moving on. So with that, I would just like to, I'm coming to the end of my presentation to share with you a diverse blend of UK companies, very well established in Malaysia. Some of these companies have been in, in Malaysia for more than 100 years and companies in UK or from UK background continue to grow and establish in Malaysia. So the chamber here, we are very, you know, we are well established to support you as you, as you explore coming into Malaysia through our networks, through our partners, through our engagements with different stakeholders. With that, can I move on to the next slide? So if any of you, after this presentation, you can contact us. So with that, thank you very much. And I would like to pass to Paul to share with you about ASEAN and the UK ABC. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And um, good morning to everybody in the UK. Good afternoon to everybody in Southeast Asia. And, and uh, Jennifer and the team, thank you very much for giving us, UK ASEAN Business Council, the opportunity to share a little bit about ASEAN and what we do as a business council and uh, the opportunities that are available in, in these markets.
Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. We seem to have had a little bit of a technical issue there on the, on the slides. So what is ASEAN? ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and that was established in 1967 to really accelerate cultural development, economic growth and social progress throughout the region. And since 1967, as it, grew, it has grown to include those 10 countries you see on the screen there, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, all very diverse economically, culturally, and politically from the high-tech market of Singapore to the recently opened up market in Myanmar, a country that has nothing and needs everything. ASEAN is strategically placed as a, a geographical hub between China and India, has a young dynamic consumer market with a population of over 630 million and just an average age of around 26. ASEAN is similar in part to other economies, single, single markets with the slow and steady integration of economies, but with no common currency or free movement of people. Around 45 million billion, sorry, uh, uh, sterling is spent a year in infrastructure projects. And that is expected to continue. And on the back of those infrastructure projects, we do know that there is opportunities for more um, sectors. So it is a growing diverse, multilingual talent pool of over 630 million, and this has created a huge middle-class consumer base where GDP per capita has seen around a 70% growth from 2007 to present day. Two, three months ago, I was saying, this is the fastest growing region in the world. Um, and due to the current COVID situation, we know that all economies are being um, hit at this moment in time. But the ASEAN economy is extremely strong um, and uh, albeit it is showing signs of decline, um, it is being reported by analysts and particularly with the IMF that ASEAN will be one of the first regions to really bounce back after post-COVID uh, and really we will see those growths um, really start to be coming out there and there are predictions of even higher growth than what you see there on the on the screen. Longer term, uh, pre and post COVID, ASEAN's growth will continue to be shaped by the economic policies, by the regional trade policies, by the investment um, incentives, and that continuation of the infrastructure financing capacities and capabilities. So I uh, just want to show you uh, a few of what they call high value sector opportunities in the region. And these are those sectors where the government feel that they can add value and, and where businesses will be, will see a strong return on, on the investment. And you can see that there are some fairly large sectors across the markets there, including education, healthcare, infrastructure, and tech. Uh, but don't worry if you're not in there. This is um, a, a recent survey of what we did on um, around 120 export opportunities across the region. And this, re this revealed around 26 sectors. And those that are underlined there are the five top sectors which were identified of at that particular time of live opportunities. And you can see their healthcare, food and drink, education, construction, retail and luxury. And um, on this particular service, retail and luxury and food and drink were the top two. So where do we fit into all this at the UK ASEAN Business Council? Well, we are the leading UK based organization promoting trade and investment between the UK and ASEAN's dynamic markets. We were created out of the then UK Trade and Investments, now Department for International Trades, um, strategy Britain open for business and we were launched back in the, the early 2010s by the then uh, business secretary the right honorable Vince Cable we were a governmental organization 
uh, but we are, have and been for many, many years a private freestanding organisation supporting companies into the marketplace. We help UK companies of all sizes build antactors, build new contacts, uh, provide market insights and raise the awareness of the vast commercial developments in what is undoubtedly one of the most exciting, vibrant and fastest growing regions in the world. We also bring ASEAN to the UK through a sustained calendar of country briefings, targeted meetings, one-to-one -one clinics and promotional events. In addition, we are signposting practical advice and guidance on how to do business in ASEAN and can provide access to a considerable network of useful contacts. I will not uh, spend too much time on this slide because Jennifer has always as, as, as mentioned this, but uh, we work extremely closely with our in-country partners in ASEAN. Those in the main are the British Chambers of Commerce being represented in eight of the 10 ASEAN countries. And um, their main activity is as uh, a British Chamber of Commerce, very, very similar to what uh, you experience with your British Chambers of Commerce here in the UK. But one of their main fortes is they are providing market entry services for UK companies. And uh, under the collective name of Britain in Southeast Asia, which Jennifer mentioned, um, mainly the executive directors are coming to the UK twice a year. We were fortunate to have them in March, just before lockdown. Um, and, and, and we hope that we will get them back later on the year when, when things um, permit. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for UK companies to be put in front of market experts on one-to-one -one meetings. So I just want to mention some of our partners there, which I have done, the British Chambers of Commerce in, uh, in ASEAN. In Vietnam, we have a British business group. And at this moment in time, uh, there are a couple of British business groups being formed in Brunei and in Laos. And uh, we're just waiting to see what services they can offer companies looking in to get into those two markets. We work also extremely closely with the Department of International Trade, not just here in London and across the nine English regions, but also across the ASEAN region, as well as our other governmental colleagues in FCO in the in the Intellectual Property Office, for instance. So these are the main partners of the UK ASEAN Business Council. The top row is our corporate partners within the Business Council. And you can see we have some very strong, strong partners there, not only here in the UK, but are also extremely strong and influential within the region. I would like to encourage you to our uh, digital platform, ukabc.org.uk, where you'll find a huge amount of information. We have a lot of insights into doing business in, in ASEAN, a lot of downloadable publications there. We also have all our events, which we are doing here in the UK. And as you can imagine now, we are uh, moving what would have been physical events to virtual events. So there's a lot of webinars there. There's a lot of conversational uh, webinars as well. But also up there is we put up upcoming events which are happening within the region, which you may be interested to hook into. There's also the opportunity there to see live export opportunities that are happening within the region. So that's us really. We are a small but very effective group headed by our executive director, Ross Hunter. We are based in London, in Millbank. And for those of you that don't know that, that's just down from the Houses of Parliament. So that's really the end of my presentation. There's my contact details there, and I'm more than happy to have a conversation, a chat with um, UK companies that are looking to get into the ASEAN market. So I'll stop there and um, hand you over to Winfield. Over to you, Winfield. Thanks, Paul. Um, I guess today's background is about the future of international trade in uncertain times. So I've chosen the topic of minds of the business leaders. Um, I have only three slides. So you will, you will see that uh, you have probably about 10 minutes to look at this slide as well, which I'll walk you through. And the first thing that I really want to talk about, it's actually the lessons from China. 
Now, in our conversations with business leaders, actually, in the last two weeks, inevitably, a question on actually what's happening in China. So, I guess allow me to start with this because hopefully it can stimulate some views on how Asia looks like when it reopens, especially in Malaysia. Now, the long and short of it is China is now back to work and in style because you even have trends of companies actually chartering trains, it's not just buses, trains, sending people back to the factories. So the entire country is back to work. Our staff in HSBC are 100% back to work. The staff of competitive banks are also back to work. So the entire country right now is classified as low risk with the exception of certain cities that are kind of bordering Russia. Um, but intercity is basically allowed. However, international travel remains restricted due to quarantine constraints. Now, let's look at the high level economic data. Now, HSBC Global Research predicts global GDP to fall by 4.4%, negative 4.4% in 2020, with developed markets actually dropping 7.1%. And this is much, much faster fall of 2.1% in 2009, 2009, right? However, in China, now considering the weaker labor and external uncertainty, in 2020, the global GDP forecast has been adjusted down from 3% to 1.7%. Now, you might think that a 1.7% is a positive region, but I can tell you that the people in China are actually quite upset. And the reason why is because when I look at the history, the lowest GDP that China ever had in recent history was in 1990. That was 3.8%. It was one year after the Tiananmen incident. Now we're talking about 1.7%. So just to give you a sense of people's mood in China. Now I just want to move on to talk about a few key sectors because people are very keen to know, you know, what are the key sectors doing and how does that, what does that mean for Asia? Now, uh, first thing first, real estate, because most people are very, have vested interest in real estate. Now, good news on the real estate front, you know, there has been a rebound on the cards. You see that actually property sales, right? in April is down 2.1%. But in the, in, in the last four months, it was actually down 19.3. So as a result, what you can see is that actually property sales is rebounding, is starting to come back. Equally on the new construction as well. If you look at March numbers, it was 10.4%. In April numbers, is 1.3% drop. So in other words, you can see that actually the construction work is also coming back. Now, since we're on the topic of construction and the other sector that people are always concerned about is infrastructure. Now, interestingly, infrastructure is picking up, but it's no longer about roads and bridges. And let me explain why. So you can see that domestic construction activity is back as more workers are returning back to work after the mandatory quarantine uh, measures, as we talked about earlier. Equally, I think policymakers are pushing for increased infrastructure development. Right? And therefore, they have already allocated issuance of special local government bonds on this. But you will find that you know, the largest Chinese companies and construction companies are not just talking about roads and bridges. What are they doing right now? I'll give you some examples. Uh, China State Construction, right? one of the largest builders in China, are looking at projects that includes Alibaba Cloud Global HQ in Hangzhou. That's a 450,000 square meters. They are talking about international data center in Lingang, Shanghai, the National Healthcare Big Data North China Storage Center, Tencent East China Cloud Computing. I think these are all technology uh, data centers and infrastructure that's actually going to integrate with IoT and AI um, and the whole technology as well. What about the overseas front? I think on the overseas front, we talk about BRI. Um, Interestingly, the progress varies from countries to countries. What we're seeing right now is, of course, I think we're seeing some signs of pickup uh, between the Chinese firms in, in MENA area, what we call Middle East. Um, you will see that they are doing a lot more new projects, uh, especially related to energy sector in Kuwait, in Egypt, and in Saudi. Um, while actually over the LATAM front, uh, Latin America, 
uh, it's on ports and subways, right? Now, back to the numbers. What does it mean to Asia? Now, I would say in the short, there are opportunities. Now, if we look at China, which was recently opened, I guess I'll just share with you four interesting observations. Number one, ASEAN, EU, US, China are China's top four trading partners, capturing 46.4% of the total value. As of April, ASEAN is now China's largest trading partner. So it's overtaken EU, it's overtaken US as well. Opportunities to Malaysia. The second thing is actually the trend towards import substitution. Now, what this means, if you look at April numbers, China's imports actually fell 14.2%. So it was not importing as much as from overseas. Now, what we hear is that the foreign, com the foreign components right now are being replaced by the local parts. As a result, you will see that there's a shift in terms of supply chain being more local as opposed to global. The third thing I would like to talk about is actually the focus on sectors. Focusing on the right sectors can actually cushion the impact. Now, as in April, you see that China's exports actually rose 3.5%, partly contributed by medical and PPE products. The last and very interesting subject I want to talk about is actually technology. Now, there's a question and hypothesis around will the rise of new economy actually uh, be the one that actually gets country out of this very difficult, challenging time. And what about its spillover effects? I just wanted to share with you, in April 20, Alibaba Group actually said that you will invest US 28 billion in its cloud infrastructure over three years. This means actually expanding Alibaba cloud technologies, including its operating systems, servers and chips, and its data centers. Now, we have a client in Hong Kong, um, it's in TMD, which is engaged in trading and electronic components like semiconductors and ICs and SOC memory chips. There's actually use in data centers and smart, for smart solutions. Now, they advised that its business actually benefited from Alibaba's latest announcement in its cloud technology. So now, Alibaba already accounts for 50% of its total sales. And with the new investments, actually, it's a, it, it will increase by a further 20%. So the point is that Technology has positive spillover effects over and above infrastructure and outside of China as well. Now let's talk about what we see in terms of trends in the shifts in supply chain. Now you'll see that since COVID impacted, start, COVID impact started in January, we had a supply side shock and we had a demand side shock. Now in short, these shocks actually pushed manufacturers be it textile and garment or electronics, to look to new destinations, not just for the first tier, the second tier, but also down to the third tier and the fourth tier suppliers as well. Now, in my view right now, the shift has found its own course. What's going to happen next is going to be a bigger wave of shifts arising from one, intervention by governments and big players let me provide you with the examples. So first, countries. Countries are now proactively encouraging local companies to de-risk their supply chain by onshoring or nearshoring. Now, which means redistributing it across closer regions. For example, Japan has instituted a 2 billion US package for companies shifting production back to Japan and a 220 million for those seeking to move production to other countries. You see that the countries are actually pushing for supply chain. Mix, give you an example of corporates. Apple is encouraging its Chinese supplier, Luxshare, to make a big investment in a Taiwanese company that manufactures metal casing for iPhones and MacBooks. TSMC, which manufactures A series chips, is moving to Arizona and US. That is a $12 billion investment between 2021 to 2029. So you can imagine that the scale of shift in supply chain is no longer just changing of buyers and suppliers that we are familiar with three months ago. Now, be it demand or supply side uh, impact, or corporate or government intervention, these supply chain shifts creates opportunities and risk. 
We know that corporates actually introduced many COVID committees and task force. These committees serve to, one, ensure operational continuity, two, secure treasury, and three, secure supply chain through mapping and monitoring of critical factors along the chain. Now, why secure supply chain? Why monitor critical factors along the chain? Well, because companies realize that the ability for its suppliers to perform is no longer just dependent on physical capacity or how resilient they are to operational disruptions. These suppliers face pressures of rising costs and delay or worse, default of payments by its other buyers. Now, setting up committees are insufficient to manage the future of international trade. And this is the subject for today, the future of international trade. To manage the future of international trade, we see corporates taking three critical actions. Let me go through the three critical action, uh, actions in my view. The first thing is risk management. Now, there is a rising level of risk as companies such as Virgin Australia, J. Crew, Eldo, J. C. Penny, Neyman Marcus have filed Chapter 11. Now, even in China, where we started to talk about, according to CBIRC, the banking sector's non-performing loan rose to 2.04% at the end of March from 1.686% last year. Now, you might think that, okay, you know, it's not that much. But I think what is really interesting is that actually banks deferred principal and interest payments on about CNY 880 billion worth of loans, which are extended to the small and micro enterprises. So that's how thin that ice is, right? Now, trade instruments, um, as financial condition in this trading ecosystem becomes more and more fragile, we suspect that the use of conventional trade instruments such as documentary credits and guarantees will rise. Uh, in March alone, HSBC across Asia Pacific witnessed a 10% increase in the volume of transactions in trade instruments. And that's the point about risk management. Um, now, can I move on to the next slide, which is on digitalization? Thank you very much. Now, um, speaking of digitalization, it's a very popular topic. Now, the active drive by multiple parties in digitizing trade. For example, the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, ICC, has already requested governments and central banks to take emergency measures to remove requirements for key trade documents to be presented in paper form. To be completely paperless while the pace will accelerate, the change will definitely take a bit more time. And it will vary from country to country depending on the readiness of banking industry and regulators. Now, while we are waiting for the state of utopia to happen, there are two things that are happening as we speak, driven by a combination of government and commercial sectors. And they are one, blockchain, and two, digital channels. So let me talk about blockchain. Now, in the case of China, the PBOC during the last four months continues to pursue domestic blockchains for LCs and cross-border blockchain for open account and LCs. Now, in HSBC, Contour, for those who are familiar, is a blockchain-based platform that digitizes the entire LC process. In the past, we ran 15 pilots, which were all designed for single one-off transactions and were conducted on isolated test network. Uh, throughout the last four months, we continue to move towards a production network, allowing multiple transactions, allowing corporates um, and other banks to transact with each other. Yes, they have seen delay in execution of a handful of corporates due to conflicting corporate activities. However, we will still see encouraging progress overall. Uh, as we see many corporates are keen to pursue pilot transactions. I'll move to digital penetration, which is my second point. Now, there is increased receptiveness from corporates to use electronic interface for document submission or simply viewing or business management. 
Even as countries were on lockdown mode, the rate of sign up for HSBC net for trade is rising. In March alone, we saw the rate was 200 corporates across Asia Pacific, and that's double that of 2019. Now, as you can see from a simple diagram on the right, you know, these transactions are processed electronically, thereby mitigating disruptions for corporates arising from even movement control orders that you talked about. In fact, this same module, which is available on mobile phones, is equally receiving a sharp increase in sign-up rate. Now, obviously, having worked from home for an extended period now, we all understand that Wi-Fi connections with laptops and bandwidth has limitations. Now, the last thing, sorry, uh, to the last slide, please. Next slide, please. My last point is on alternative financing options. Now, in the last couple of weeks, there's also an emerging trend. Um, at HSBC, we have approximately 200 existing supply chains with clients. Our latest record shows that there is over 37% increase in utilization volume as well. Now, this, at the same time, there's also a spike in terms of inquiries for these new programs. These are across all sectors, especially technology, cloud services, food and beverage manufacturing, including automotive. My estimate is there's three times increase, and this is across Asia Pacific, such as China, Indonesia, Philippines, Hong Kong, and of course, um, Malaysia. Now, um, a lot of people find that supply chain programs are very complicated, but if I may just preempt a question uh, from clients, um, I would just say that the methodical way of looking at the supply chain program, there are only eight steps. From analysis of procurement activities to agreeing of commercial terms to system integration and finally training. In fact, our shortest record is 10 working days, uh, but I do have to caveat that the speed depends heavily on corporates and suppliers' readiness. Now, let me end with where I started. The shift in supply chain, in particularly onshoring import substitution and the rise of new economies, presents new opportunities, but creates a new dimension of risk. The world post-COVID is a world of uncertainties, and if there are three things that business leaders are doing, I would say securing supply chain, embracing digital systems, and consider new cash flow enhancing financing options. Thank you for your attention, and I hand it back to the host. Thank you. Next, we have Vishal. Yep. Hi, right. can we go to my first slide? The next one, thank you. So I'll, um, I'll kick off by just giving you a few uh, um, pointers on uh, how we're looking at uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in fact, uh, Paul and Winfield mentioned that ASEAN is going to be the first region uh, to bounce back. Um, in that, uh, Winfield added that ASEAN is now uh, China's biggest trade partner. So if you look at that, um, there are a few things uh, that are listed on the slide, uh, which clearly indicate that there are a bunch of things which are going in favor of Southeast Asia as well as in favor of Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is the 19th largest exporter in the world. It is UK's second largest ASEAN trade partner, and it is home to over 5,000 MNCs for more than, um, from more than 40 countries and uh, listed companies in ASEAN. Now, these are all stats and numbers. So what's the story behind all of these numbers? Let me um, run you through some of the negatives that we are seeing, and then we'll get into uh, some views on how we're looking at uh, Malaysia as it tackles the current crisis. Um, in terms of the negatives that we have seen, um, it's clear that Malaysia is facing a drop in GDP with a contraction which is already visible. Uh, investments are getting delayed. Um, supply chains are getting impacted. Um, Winfield mentioned it's both a supply side and a demand side issue. Uh, Malaysia does have a supply chain connect on both sides. 
uh, if you look at the electronics industry, uh, it procures all the equipment and all the raw materials from uh, a bunch of markets nearby, and then it produces goods uh, for use in, uh, in Europe and the developed markets. So yes, we are seeing a bit of an impact on that. But let me move on to the positives. Uh, Malaysia still remains a key component in uh, the global supply chain. Uh, we still remain a good destination to invest in if you look at how developed the supply chain is in Malaysia and the kind of connect it has uh, with the ASEAN countries. The other thing is Malaysia is strategically positioned right at the heart of ASEAN and it has the requisite uh, uh, setup in terms of uh, the financial sector as well as a very talented work pool which is available for any investment to take place. Um, I, I'll just give you a few words on what I feel right now is the current situation. Uh, most of you have seen it. Um, there is one word to describe it. It's probably chaos. Um, everybody is trying to figure out how to kind of deal with situations and the current uh, supply chain impacts. But uh, let me quote an example which I heard recently uh, in one, one of the uh, webinars that I, I attended. It's imagine the world as a stage where 7 billion people are performing. Uh, imagine asking all the 7 billion uh, to get off the stage. Um, further, imagine after a while to get all of, the, all of the 7 billion to come back and start performing again. What is your first view? It's going to be chaos. It is what we are facing right now. It's not that we can't get all 7 billion back to work. It's just that it's going to take a little bit of effort and some bit of uh, learning from the countries like China, Hong Kong, and other markets uh, which have really got out of this. So is this the time to see beyond the chaos and into the crystal ball to see what are the underlying fundamentals of the Malaysian economy. Um, next slide, please. This is the current status. This is ground zero. What we realize uh, looking at this is the fact that despite the fact that when the COVID crisis started, Malaysia was one of the highest uh, uh, countries with infections. However, as the time has gone by, what you have seen is the number of infections in Malaysia hover around 6,000 only. It is no longer uh, the country in ASEAN with the highest infections. It is probably third or fourth. The government uh, actions that have been taken have ensured that the flattening of the curve, which is so often talked about, has actually happened uh, in Malaysia. And if you see the chart, it tells you uh, that countries like uh, the nearby markets uh, like Singapore, Indonesia, have suddenly seen a jump uh, in these uh, numbers. And consequently, the related recovery from this might take a bit more time than it has taken in case of Malaysia. Um, I would also state that while the pandemic has happened, it's hit Malaysia, but the response that the government has given, the response that the companies have uh, joined hands with and, and produced has been pretty strong. The government provided measures um, in terms of liquidity, stimulus packages, and money directly in the hand of people uh, very, very early in, um, in the crisis. The restriction order came in on March 18th and ensured that the infection doesn't spread. All the benefit of all these initiatives is being felt now where the infections have dropped, uh, the number of deaths have dropped and sometimes touch wood, they remain very, very low. Uh, and the economic activity has started to pick up as the government has allowed most of the sectors to start operating again. And this is not with 50% workforce, but it's almost 100% provided they follow uh, the basics of hygiene and uh, ensure that the coronavirus issue doesn't come up. So economic activity is starting to pick up. 
Um, I would also state that the government still has a lot of monetary and fiscal uh, room to step in and provide support, uh, apart from all that has been provided till now. Um, I'll end by saying this is not a financial crisis. This is a social and biological crisis. The government and the financial industry is standing jointly to support the businesses to perform. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the current state of Malaysia? Apart from the ground zero, which we started with in uh, March 18th onwards, uh, we are in May. Uh, and all the points that are listed have clearly indicated that Malaysia has the resilience uh, to stand up and ensure that it comes out of the MCO uh, very, very strongly. And I'll, I'll give you some points as to why uh, we feel that this will happen. Uh, there has been a measured response by the government to open up the economy. It's not, it's not a shutdown and a restart. It's been very measured. Essential services never shut down. They were always operating. People were not allowed to step out, but they could if they had a definite need and they needed to buy uh, food stuff and essentials. So we never really shut down, but we were very measured and controlled all through the opening. When the government opened up in the last few weeks, again, it's been with guidelines and it's been with measures to state Let's open up, but open up well so that we don't have another curve starting. During the MCO, the private consumption expanded almost 0.9%. Let me quote that, compare that with Indonesia, which contracted by 0.1% quarter on quarter. Now, it's important to understand the context of this statement. Malaysia is a 35 million uh, uh, population country and Indonesia probably around 350. It's a factor of 10 higher. Further, Indonesia is the second biggest economy, the third biggest economy after India and China in Asia Pacific. And the most important point, Indonesia did not shut down. Indonesia was open. Despite the fact that they were open and Malaysia wasn't, we have seen Malaysia grow in private consumption. Why did that happen? This is a result of the fact that a large share of consumer activity in Malaysia has shifted over uh, to digital. Malaysia itself is ahead of even Italy when you look at digital adoption and e-commerce. Most of us in Malaysia are able to consume all the products that are available purely sitting on a mobile phone and ordering, and it works just fine. The government also acted very, very swiftly to ensure that the resilience uh, uh, got support with a very large fiscal stimulus in the beginning of uh, the crisis. And they've been coming up with various stages to ensure that they keep providing the support. I'll give you just one example of a small support that they provided with reduction in the mandatory pension contribution. Uh, for Malaysians. It's a small step. However, when we realize the underground, underlying background of this, with the fact that Malaysia has one of the highest household debts in Asia Pacific, you suddenly realize a small uh, cut in the rates, a small uh, reduction in the mandatory pension contributions adds in to ensure that there is strong stability that's provided to the private households it also provides a direct relief of 18 billion or so of ringgits when you reduce the interest rates to the extent that the government has done. Again, ensuring that the households are resilient, not just the companies which produce. Government still has flexibility. Uh, it may cut uh, uh, another 25 bips to 100 bips uh, in OPR and in SRR, which is the statutory reserve ratio. That room allows the government to still look at what the situation is evolving as and then decide uh, how to kind of take uh, through this. Uh, I'll quote a quick statement by BNM, which is the Bank Negara, the Central Bank of Malaysia, which states, the bank will utilize its policy levers as appropriate to create an enabling condition for a sustainable economic recovery. And they have actually done exactly 
uh, what they're talking about. Uh, can I move to my last slide, please? Next one. So I'll quickly run through this. Um, the uh, future state, apart from looking at ground zero and then looking at what we are doing now, what's going to happen at uh, the end of the year and maybe in 2021. Um, growth in 2021 is likely to rebound very, very strongly to 6.3%. This is due to uh, the already stated projects, infrastructure projects, which are in play, they have been slow uh, to execute, as uh, Jennifer mentioned in the beginning, because we've had a little bit of a political change in the system. So it's just taking a bit of time. But the government has clearly said that nothing is being changed. The policies remain and we will support the infrastructure spending. Uh, looking at 6.3 percent growth in 2021, I would state that it is uh, probably going to be one of the strongest uh, uh, growths that we will see from Malaysia. Uh, the government has also provided close to 17% of the GDP, which is roughly around 250 billion of ringgits, as a stimulus package, again, supporting this growth. Now, looking at UK, yes, we do see the GDP drop like Malaysia this year, but we are also seeing a growth in 2021. We also expect the Bank of England to announce um, maybe another round of QE later on in the coming months. The only thing that we uh, think is going to impact this probably slightly negatively is the post-Brexit transition period that we see at the year end. However, if you look at some of the companies that Jennifer listed out, if you look at the point that almost 5,000 uh, MNCs call Malaysia as its home, you will realize there is a very strong opportunity that exists as both UK and Malaysia grow uh, to grow together because at the end of it, ASEAN is going to be the uh, location where a lot of growth is going to happen next year. And Malaysia being at the heart of ASEAN would be uh, a place where you can come in uh, invest and see your investments grow. Um, I would um, uh, stop in um, in light of the time. However, um, uh, handing over uh, to the coordinator to uh, just um, continue with the webinar. Thank you. I'm back. Um, I'm going to take uh, assist to take some questions from the audience. Thank you, Vishal and Winfield, for an uh, interesting uh, presentation, especially and giving us a good overview on where the region is in terms of a windfill from China and how the company, China and Hong Kong, how the companies are responding are back, what is in the top of the mind of the companies today. And Vishal, thank you for sharing about Malaysia and how resilient Malaysia is. We have a number of questions. So I will go to the one that is on. Um, okay, let's take a, a one that's um, very much a, a shorter one, which talks about what impact does the weakness or the slump in oil prices have, you know, the impact to the recovery to you know, sectors like tourism and Malaysia's ability to fund the recovery. Would you like to take that on? Uh, yeah, I, I'll, um, I'll upfront say I'm not an expert in oil. Uh, <laughs> however, I do know uh, the question has uh, relevance because Malaysia is one of the few countries in ASEAN which actually uh, does produce oil. Uh, most of the other countries are consumers of oil. Um, having seen this, having seen the oil price drop and having seen how the travel industry has uh, kind of taken a hit. Um, I would uh, just state that for the current moment, the government has uh, planned to leverage on its existing uh, tools to ensure that the economy kicks off in the sectors that have been identified by them uh, to contribute. Yes, there is going to be an impact in there is going to be fiscal deficit, which will get yielded because of the oil price drop. However, because of the investment that they are planning to do uh, in the relevant sectors, in the uh, essential sectors, 
as well as the contribution that they're providing to the domestic households and ensuring that the debt that they have does not become overbearing. For the moment, um, it looks like we will be able to contain this effect. Yes, there will be fiscal deficit, uh, but that is something which currently is manageable. Uh, the central bank still has room to play on both the fiscal side and on the monetary side to uh, make some changes. Um, the next question is, I think it can be um, to both of you, Vishal and uh, Winfield. I think Winfield can, uh, uh, on the region side, it's um, Jason Chan asked, asked us, one of the biggest challenge in managing COVID, post-COVID situation is managing regulations. As banking is a highly regulated sector, do you see Malaysia, or here I will extend it to Asia Pacific, moving in the right direction in support of the businesses to the re right regulations? Perhaps I'll take a shot at this question first and Vishal can supplement. Actually across a ASEAN in this COVID-19 situation, I don't think that, um, I think what the, the regulators are doing across the entire region is just simply phenomenal. Uh, in terms of the speed at which the relief mac packages are actually being rolled out in different shapes and sizes and forms across different countries, uh, from accelerating documentation to even deferring um, some of the loan principles as well. Now, what is actually most interesting is that um, I like what they're doing right now because they're directly injecting liquidity into the SMEs. Now, as you can see that the SMEs are actually the ones that needs the working capital um, most desperately. So this is a much, this in this crisis, I see them doing much better. However, I would still advocate for more drive towards digitalization because regulators need to create the right framework and infrastructure uh, to enable digitalization, which therefore allows much better security and efficiency. Um, but that would be my views. Vishal, feel free to add. Yeah, no, I, I would state, uh, picking up from your uh, um, presentation, Winfield, um, I mean, the way ICC is pushing the regulators to work towards digitalizing all international trade is, uh, uh, is the right way to go about it. And I think uh, the governments are realizing that. Um, I, again, uh, would like to reiterate that um, the way Malaysian government has supported uh, with a very sizable uh, stimulus package early in the crisis and the way they decisively uh, and in a measured way acted uh, to contain the crisis um, has been something which is remarkable. Uh, you see the result now because we are opening up. Uh, in terms of... Uh, providing liquidity, which the regulators have again supported, uh, the, uh, the normal uh, uh, population of the country, as well as uh, the corporates, uh, they have provided liquidity in the hands of people. They've provided liquidity in the hands of uh, uh, the corporates. So I would say the COVID situation is making them act very, very fast. Yes, everybody knows we, the change is getting accelerated here across the board. Everybody's trying to do things faster. Um, I'm very pleased to say that the speed with which the governments are acting across the world, I'm not just saying Malaysia, uh, in providing the support, gives you a very clear indication that it is at the heart of the governments right now. They know they need to act and they are acting. And especially from uh, a Malaysia point of view, uh, we have MIDA, we have InvestKL, we have MDEC, we have uh, BMCC, we have AmCham. All these various entities together uh, are connected and we are providing the necessary support in the country to ensure that uh, all the requisite uh, tools are available for the governments to ensure the corporate sector opens up and succeeds. Thank you, Vishal. I think uh, we are running out of time, but to just take one quick question uh, for Winfield. And, mm. um, and the rest of the questions are very sector specific. So perhaps, you know, the BMCC could have a, we could respond separately to the, to the person who's asking the question. 
So the question to uh, Winfield is, if China is going for import substitution and producing locally, it is, is it bad for ASEAN countries, which are part of the supply chain? And how, what's your view on that, Winfield? It's a very, very good question. Now, my, my take on this is two, two folds. I think, first of all, uh, whatever China is actually substituting in terms of imports, in my view, are mainly high-end components coming from Europe, coming from US, and coming from Japan. So the impact on ASEAN, I would say, is fairly small because the type of goods that we're talking about um, are not the kind of substitutes. So that's one. Now, in the event, uh, as, as other countries in ASEAN starts to open up, and if indeed import substitution is going to be the phenomenon across ASEAN, I find it quite exciting as well. The reason why is ASEAN itself, based on what I understand, it's a 660 million in terms of population, the 660 million population. You have a GDP per capita on average across ASEAN, 11,000. You have a young population, a higher propensity to spend, and you have a large population. The amount of effects, uh, economic multiplier effect, if the ASEAN will be able to manufacture for just ASEAN alone is already very, very exciting. Um, so I, I look at it quite positively in, in my view, Jennifer. I hope that answers the, the participants' uh, question. As I mentioned, uh, I think I need to pass it back to Sam to do the closing. And uh, for all the other questions that are sector specific, we will reach out to the participants and try to see if we could have a chat with them to answer those questions. So with that, uh, can I pass back to uh, Sam? Thanks, Jennifer. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our speakers from HSBC and also UKABC, Vishal, Winfield and Paul for providing clarifications on the outlook of the ASEAN region as well as measures to mitigate prevailing impacts on the current and future fate of international trade in Malaysia. Thank you all for an excellent session and support. We shall meet again tomorrow for another BNCC trade webinar on COVID-19, a catalyst to Malaysia's IR 4.0. Thank you to all our participants. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.